American literary icon and a provocative public figure. He was often described as debonair, aristocratic, and irrepressible. A novelist, he's written for Broadway, television, a dramatist, screenwriter. Uh, was a congressional candidate, been an actor, political debater. Harvey Dahl's reputation among scholars is of an agile provocateur. He's a lively, witty mind, but very much enslaved by certain prejudices. I follow him in the press. I follow him as a politician. I follow him as a friend. He is one of the players in American politics and has been over the last 30 years and more. He's the wittiest of all American writers. Most of us aren't witty at all. Honesty is just unbelievable. He just doesn't... He's unable to not tell the truth. He has a rather prickly personality, you know. <laughs> How popular to expect a porcupine to be. <laughs> Taking pictures here. I'm still trying to look natural. I will take this occasion once again to speak louder. <laughs> Stereotypes are irresistible, particularly in wartime. Now, I know. I was, in a, in, I was an American soldier in the great race war against Japan. Before I left to go to the Pacific, uh, we were given an indoctrination course on how to tell our exquisite allies, the Chinese, from our brutish enemy, the Japanese. So on a stage like this, there, were, there was a life-size cutout of a naked Chinese youth, and there was another one of a Japanese. The Chinese was tall, slim, and well-proportioned. The Japanese was bandy-legged, buck tooth, sub subhuman. These details were pointed out very seriously to us by an information officer with a pointer. But the principal difference he announced, as you can plainly see, is the pubic hair. <laughs> the Japanese is thick and wiry, while the Chinese is straight and silky. I fear that I alone raised my hand to ask, what sly strategies we were to use <laughs> to determine friend from foe. I've always found, though, that the people, the right to lifers, they say, thou shalt not kill, you must never kill a fetus, but they're all in favor of capital punishment. I've never understood this. I, I think this is what, in, in theology, we call a divine mystery, you know how. <laughs> Political stats. Do I think that being gay has anything to do with my political stand? I have never said that I was anything at all. I am ecumenical. Well, it was the first novel that had been published in England or America, or anywhere as far as I know, that dealt very openly uh, with homosexuality as being a perfectly normal sexual activity. Until then, all the books that had, been, that had touched upon this uh, were exotic. If you had a homosexual, uh, well, you almost never had a protagonist. There'd be a minor character. And it would always be a ballet dancer or a hairdresser or something like that. And it would be somebody quite effeminate. And I was dealing with two all-American boys, two young athletes, one of whom falls in love with the other. And th this was very, very shocking. After they set up the United States, they set it up, really, that pursuit of happiness was rather a dangerous phrase, though it also has its good side. But we became really the greediest society on Earth, you know, killing the Indians, grabbing lands, picking wars with other countries, conquering, conquering, conquering. And the society really was based on me, me, me. So all the bright people went into business. And they left then, I mean, why become a senator when you can buy one? God is blackmailer. Uh, God is uh, warden of the prison. We created us all in his image, probably a mistake, and uh, then allows us to run wild and punishes us or <laughs> rewards us with his beaming vision of himself. This is no God I really want to have any traffic with at all. You know, a man of the cloth has as, every much, has as much right as anybody else to support a political candidate. 
He has every right to do it on television. He has every right to, to well, get it. Well, that's his... not clear. Does he have oh, the right? Oh, sure he has, yeah. He a has... tax-free institution in America well, can... That's, well, this is the point. The separation of church and state? Well, the, we don't separate it quite that much. If he wants to get out and talk that he, if the Reverend Falwell is for Reagan, he can say he's for Reagan. If the Reverend Falwell says, you send me your money now, I want some money, send me $25 waiting for the check, you know, and if you're dumb enough to send the money, he has every right to, you know, this, this country was based on uh, never give a sucker an even break. If he wants to get millions of dollars uh, from hustling on television and then use it for politics, he has every right. But he should not be tax exempt. Every religion in the United States is tax exempt. These are the biggest ripoffs, some of them, including the legitimate leg uh, religions, right along with uh, the blessed L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology fame and the South Korean Messiah. These people are in business to mint money. So I would say let them pick up as much money as they can and then have a man from the IRS come right in and say, all right, give us our share. They, sh they should no longer be tax exempt. American writers have shied away pretty much from, say, dealing with power. Now, power, I think, I tend to agree with Adler rather than Freud, that most people, it isn't love they want, it isn't even sex they want. What they really want is power over another person. Which they get in emotional terms. Often. Indeed. Power is a fascinating theme. This is one of the greatness of Shakespeare. Shakespeare really did very little on the subject of love when you think about it, and much, much more on simply the will to power in men, how it expresses itself, what we ought to do about it, uh, how we respond to it, and I think that's been a theme in, certainly in my life. Well, I don't know where he is now, <laughs> but I haven't seen him lately. <laughs> You're such no, a... Charlie, <laughs> you know how the naughty thing that was to say. <laughs> and, um... I wouldn't have much good to say about the administration, though. I certainly liked him. He had a great sense of humor. He was a superb gossip. There was nothing on earth he didn't know. So he was probably the best company of any politician I've ever known, and the least self-important. Jack was restlessly firing away at a, at a target. And Jay said, to Tennessee, would you like to try a shot or two at the target? Well, he said, I haven't shot a gun in some time. He said, Tennessee, and picked it up and made four bullseyes in a row. <laughs> then at one point, Tennessee was looking at Jack. He said, you know, that boy's got a cute ass. And I said, Tennessee, that's the next president. You can't prove, oh, he said, you'll never be president. They're much too attractive for the American people. I remember one evening at the White House, Jackie slyly said, oh, why don't we go to the horse show? And Jack groaned. She said, no, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll just look in. And he groaned and moaned and complained, but he said, all right, let me come. What shall I wear? And she then put on this, went out of the room, came back in a bright red dress. He said, no, things are going too bad in Europe can't wear red. She went back, she made about three changes and ends up in a Chanel suit, I think it is. So we get to the horse show and we end up there almost an hour and he is squirming and raging and gossiping with me behind her back and is telling me the entire plot of an Edgar Wallace novel about how a prime minister has been warned that he'll be shot by midnight. Because I'd said, you know, it'd be so easy to shoot you here, they'll probably miss you and hit me. And he said, that's no great loss. He was fun. And I'd be very, very nervous. You have written lately of your intimacy with Reagan and with Nixon, and that you've discussed the Vietnam War with them, and that you were satisfied with their positions. Since you were in favor of the invasion of Cuba, since you were in favor of bombing the nuclear potentiality of China, since you were in favor of nuclear bombing of, of North Vietnam, I'd be very worried about your kind of odd neurosis. I would worry about neurosis being a friend of anybody who might be a president. I would be if very I were one of the candidates, I would say, Bill Buckley, don't stay home. If it is a novelty in Chicago, that is too bad. But I assume that the point of the American democracy yeah. and is you can express any point of view you want. 
Shut up a minute. No, I won't. And some people were pro Nazi, no, and the answer is that they were they were well treated by people who ostracized them. And I'm for ostracizing people who egg on other people to shoot American Marines and American soldiers. As I know you don't as care. Far as I'm concerned, the only sort of pro or crypto Nazi yes. I can think of is yourself. Uh, Failing that. That's, I would only that's say that we can't names. have. Now listen, you the right yeah. of the stop calling me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names. Stop you in your get... goddamn face, and let's... you'll stay plastered. Gentlemen, let's oh, Bill. Let the author of Myra Brackenridge I... go back to his pornography and stop making any allusions of Nazi. I beg somebody you was to. Somebody infantry in the last war. You were not an infantry, Nazi. as a matter of fact. I was a second fighter. You were not. Now you're distorting your own military record. Where's Bill Buckley tonight? Bill? Bill? You can come out now. About Capote, he was the most illegitimate literary figure we ever produced. He was also a consummate liar. He never stopped lying. And I finally took him to court. I sued him for libel, and I won. And he has to print a huge apology to me in one of his very last books. Back to Capote again. Did you say what I heard you had said when he died? Well, I said it, but I said it in <laughs> private to Jason Epstein, my editor, who had run me from New York to say that Truman had ridden on ahead and crossed the Shining River. Mm -hmm. And I did say, well, that was a good career move. So you did say that. I yeah. did say it, but I did not say it to the public. And Jason, of course, told everybody. And so I got full credit for having been stony-hearted at the loss of a confrere <laughs> uh, without price, yeah. the greatest jewel, the greatest zircon in the diadem of mm. American literature. To apologize? <clears throat> I would apologize if uh, if it hurts your feelings, of course I will. No, it hurts my sense of intellectual pollution. Well, I must say, as, I mean, uh, <laughs> there's an the, expert you should know uh, about. I would have some scores to settle. <laughs> well, uh, no, I'll let the scores be settled. Most of my people I've disapproved of yeah. have gone to the other place. <laughs> so in the long run, we go back to my notion that the only art form the United States has ever created is the TV commercial. That is our art form and that's how we control people. And it's a world of illusions, and it's a world of false claims. Mike, I am so in touch with reality, and you are so far off base, and I cannot begin to save your soul in the remaining seconds that are left to us.